Well, shalom, everyone. Welcome once again to our monthly Rosh Kadesh meeting. For those of you meeting in groups, you can pause this video now for a time of opening prayer and worship and join us again at your convenience. So, welcome back. As you can see, this is our ninth monthly message, the month history. I think it's helpful to review our cyclical biblical calendar again to see where Tishri fits in God's scheme of things. We're now more than halfway through around the cycle. The spring feast and Shavuot or Pentecost are long past. The hot, dry summer is ending. We've endured the trying season of dire straits, so that was right in here, and began to get a breath of fresh air in the last month of Elul right here, where we learned that through the gift of repentance, teshuva, our relationship with God can be restored and we are beginning to be refreshed in His presence. Now comes Tishri. Taking a closer look, we see that there is again a cluster of three feasts or holy days in Tishri, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So they're right there and right there. We'll briefly refer to these in this message, but for a fuller teaching, look for a further message in the Biblical Feast and Season series called the Fall Feast to be posted in a few days. Last month, I introduced this slide of Lul and the season of Teshuva or repentance. As you can see, the 40 days of Teshuva began on the first day of Elul, and I'll show you that right here. So there's the first of Elul, and the 40 day period is there. And this corresponds to when Moses returned to Mount Sinai for the second set of the Ten Commandments. Those 40 days end on Yom Kippur on the 10th of Tishri, right there. And on the 15th of Tishri, right over here, the seven days of Sukkot begins. Here's a close-up view of that part of the timeline. The first day of Tishri is referred to as Rosh Hashanah, meaning the head of the year. That's right here, or New Year's on the Hebrew calendar. The Bible calls this day Yom Teruah, meaning the day of trumpets. And we see here the symbol of the blowing of the shofar. The first 10 days of Tishri are called the days of awe, culminating on the 10th with Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. As mentioned, Sukkot, or Tabernacle, starts on the 15th and runs for seven days. This will all be explained in the Fall Feast message, but I just want you to see how it all fits into the present month. Please also notice this symbol of the balance scales here on the chart right there. We'll see the symbol connected to Tishri a bit later in today's message. Here's a slide we've seen before when I taught on the Spring Feasts of the Lord. The rabbis connected the fact that there are seven Feasts of the Lord with the seven stems of the menorah that stood in the sanctuary of the Tabernacle of Moses and the Temple. As you can see, the feasts in order, starting here from your left to right, are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost. Then we have Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles, the three Fall Feasts of Tishri. Here we see symbolically that the first four feasts have been fulfilled. If you review the messages in the Biblical Feast and Season series on Passover and Pentecost, or Shavuot, you'll learn how Yeshua Jesus fulfilled the first four feasts. The last three feasts, the Fall Feasts in Tishri, 
as demonstrated here, are as yet unfulfilled. But you can be sure that Yeshua will be the one to fulfill these also. And given the times we are in, you can be sure this will happen soon. So follow me through this message as we study how the feasts connect into Tishri and the annual biblical cycle. And then be sure to view the Fall Feast video. Now, Tishri is the seventh biblical month on the biblical calendar. The meaning of this name, given from the time of the Babylonian captivity, is beginning, which comes from the Hebrew word reshit, as in bereshit, the first word of the Bible meaning in the beginning. Bereshit is the Hebrew name of the first book of the Bible. Interestingly, it comes from the root word rosh, meaning head, which we see in Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, and even in Rosh Kadesh, meaning the head of the month. The seventh month is one of the few months that is given a Hebrew name in the scriptures, and that name is Ephanim. It occurs in 1 Kings 8 verse 2, which states, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ephanim, which is the seventh month. In fact, we learn here that in the seventh month, in 826 BC, the Ark of the Covenant is brought up to the newly built Temple of Solomon. The Temple is dedicated and God wonderfully fills it with His glory, so that not even the ministering priests could manage to stand on their feet before His presence. The meaning of the word ethanim is ever-flowing streams, and that word is rooted in the word ethon, which means permanence, hard, mighty, Mighty, rough, strength, strong. So the month is also referred to as the month of the strong or the month of the ancients. Although Tishri starts the head of the new year on what we can call the Hebrew calendar or rabbinic calendar, it is the seventh month of the biblical calendar, which as we have studied began in Nisan. To establish this biblically, and the Bible is always our authority, as we learned in earlier messages, in Exodus 12, 2, God told Moses that the month Nisan, also called Abib or Aviv, should be the beginning of months, the first month of the year. In another passage, Exodus 34, 22, God spoke to Moses about the observance of the three sets of annual feasts. He specifically referred to the fall feasts as the feast of ingathering or harvest at the turning of the year. In other words, a new revolution or cycle begins in the calendar year. So Nisan, the first month, begins the counting of the months, whereas Tishri, in the seventh month, begins the counting of the years. The rabbis believe that the earth was created on the 25th of Elul, which means that man, Adam, was created on the first of Tishri. And according to their calculations, we are now beginning the year 5777. You can unearth all sorts of prophetic insight from this. Here in the seventh month are observed the fifth, sixth, and seventh of the feasts of the Lord. And now here we are in the year 5777. Well, the number seven speaks of completion, fulfillment, perfection. For example, on the seventh day, God's creation was complete and perfect, and He rested. We learn in an earlier message that the Hebrew letter used for the number seven is Zion, which is a weapon, a sword, speaking of warfare. But it can also depict a plow, speaking of provision and harvest. The number five is the number of grace. So you could say that in 5777, we have grace for warfare and harvest. Of course, with three sevens in the year, there's a threefold intensity. That's just a very brief synopsis. It's very significant that the constellation associated with the month Tishri is Libra, the scales. Do you remember when we looked at that linear chart a few slides ago that there was a sketch of a balanced scales connected to the first of Tishri, which is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Teruah? Scales, of course, have to do with weighing, but they are also a symbol of judgment. Often you will find balance scales on the building or door of a courthouse or other institution of law and justice. 
Judaism teaches that Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment when the books of life and death are opened on the heavenly desk to examine us to determine if our names are found in the book of life. Again, I'll recommend that you watch our next video on the fall feast to get the bigger picture. But the themes of judgment and atonement are important aspects of Tishri. When I set up this slide, I couldn't help think of the passage from Daniel 5, verse 27. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You might recall that this was part of Daniel's interpretation of the writing on the wall by the hand of God against Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, when his kingdom was taken from him. But under the new covenant, the apostle Paul, speaking of how we participate in the table of the Lord or communion, said in part, but let a man examine himself, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 28, 31-32. Now, let's have a look at Lamed, the Hebrew letter associated with Tishri. It has the value of 30 and pictures a shepherd's staff. Personally, I found Lamed to be a fascinating letter to study, very rich with meaning. Firstly, it is significant that it is the tallest Hebrew letter, the only one that rises above the baseline. Being the twelfth letter in the alphabet, it is considered the central letter or the heart of the alphabet. Remember the word heart, as we'll see it again in a moment. In the ancient pictograph form of the letter, it depicts a cattle goat or a shepherd's staff. The staff of a shepherd speaks of guidance, authority, discipline, even correction or judgment, themes associated with Tishri and the fall feasts. When Lamed is added to the front of the Hebrew word, like a prefix, it has the meaning of to or toward or belonging to, so it is also a associated with giving direction. For instance, a shepherd will extend his or her staff to give direction to direct the sheep to food or water. The name of the letter Lamed comes from the root Lamed, which means to learn or teach. That word first occurs in Deuteronomy 4 verse 1. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. So Lamed points to the source of all learning, the Torah. And we get the sense from this that Torah is not so much meant to be rigid laws and harsh reg regulations, but it's rather intended as guidance and instruction, pointing us to the way for a good life. Now, remember, I asked you to pay attention to the word heart. Quoting from Hebrew for Christians, Rabbi Akiva, who lived from 50 to 135 AD, is said to have noted that the spelling of Lamed can be seen in an acronym for the phrase Lev, may have been da'at, meaning a heart that understands knowledge. In other words, the goal of learning and teaching, Lamad, is heart knowledge. Moreover, since it is the only letter allowed to ascend above the other letters in the sacred writings, Lamed represents the prominence of learning and understanding in the Jewish heart. Now, reading from the site Chabad.org, in an article called The Jewish Heart, I quote, this Jewish heart is a symbol for why we were created and what we are meant to accomplish. For the Torah is the blueprint of creation and the guidebook of how we connect to the divine. And it is not a book that has a beginning, middle, and end, but rather a scroll, since we are taught that the end is wedged in the beginning and the beginning in the end. So what do we find when the Torah scroll's end rolls into the beginning? How does the Torah end? and begin, the last word of the Torah is Yisrael, Israel, which ends with the letter Lamed, and the first word is Bereshit, meaning in the beginning, which begins with a bait. When we join the first and last letters of the Torah, we have Lev, the Hebrew word for heart.
Let me explain. When we study the fall feasts, you'll see that the last feast, Sukkot, runs for seven days, and the next and eighth day is a Jewish holiday called Simchat Torah, meaning rejoicing in or with the Torah. This day celebrates and marks the conclusion of the annual cycle of public Torah readings and the beginning of the new cycle. Interesting that the number eight, the eighth day, speaks of new beginnings. The last book of the Torah is Deuteronomy, or Devarim in Hebrew, and it ends with the word Israel, which ends with the letter Lamed. On Simchat Torah, when the scroll of the Torah is cycled back to the first book, Genesis, or Breshit in Hebrew, the first word is Breshit, translated in the beginning, which starts with the letter Bet. Now, Lamed Bet spells the word Lev, which translates into English as heart. So, in the month Tishri, when we continue in repentance, Teshuva, and enter into being examined and weighed for judgment, we are reminded that it is by the Torah that we are judged. But Torah is a matter of the heart, not just outward compliance and deeds. The lesson is, don't just read Torah, but let the Torah read you. Now, we also see here that the letter Lamed is used as the number 30, and this speaks of several things. Firstly, 30 can symbolize dedication. In the Jewish economy, it was understood that a person reached maturity at the age of 30, which is the age the Aaronic priests were dedicated to their office. Both John the Baptist, or John the Immerser, and Yeshua began their ministries at 30. Also, 30 pieces or shekels of silver comes up several times in the Bible. In Exodus 21:32, we see that it is the price of ransom or redemption of a person's slave if your ox gores or him or her. The prophet Zechariah received 30 pieces of silver for his work as a shepherd, and in obedience to God, he cast it to the potter in the temple. This was prophetic of the events much later recorded by Matthew, in chapters 26 and 27. There, Judas, as you will recall, was paid 30 pieces of silver for betraying Yeshua to the high priest, and he later cast that money into the temple when the priest refused to take it back from him. In Matthew 27, 6, we see that they could not put it into the temple treasury because it was the price of blood, and so they bought the potter's field to bury strangers in. So you could say that the number 30 is associated with the ransom of a life and the blood of redemption. And again, this is a theme associated with Tishri and the Day of Atonement. So, I believe we can summarize the message of Lamed to say that if we will read the Torah and let the Torah read us, and if we obey it from the heart and examine and judge our own hearts to see if our lives line up with Torah, if we repent of our sins and transgressions, dedicate ourselves to the Lord and receive the atonement provided for us by the death and shed blood of Yeshua, then we are the redeemed of the Lord. We can have confidence that our names are written in the Book of Life. We can then enter into the final feast of Tishri, Sukkot or Tabernacles, which is a great joyful feast that speaks of the presence of God in our midst, our fellowship with Him and His bountiful harvest and provision. As Yeshua said, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. Now, before we close this message, let's take a look at the tribe of Tishri. As you will recall, the order of the tribes around the tabernacle is given in Numbers 2, 1 to 34. Here we see the enlarged view. The first six tribes associated with the first six months of the biblical year, as we've already studied, are positioned to the east and south of the sanctuary that's over here. Ephraim is the first tribe in the west over here, and so Ephraim is the seventh tribe and is associated with the seventh month, Tishri. Now, the whole matter 
of the inclusion of Ephraim and his brother Manasseh among the 12 tribes is an interesting subject and can get quite complicated, but I'll try to keep it simple. Firstly, they were not sons of Jacob at all, but rather as the sons of Joseph, they were Jacob's grandsons. Let's look quickly at our earlier slide of the 12 tribes. Here we see Ephraim and his brother Manasseh. So who's missing? These two grandsons took the places of two of Jacob's sons, Levi and Joseph. Take a look at this blue portion here, arranged around the sanctuary in the midst of the camp. This is the area assigned to the sons of Levi. According to Deuteronomy 18.2, the tribe of Levi would have no inheritance amongst their brethren because the Lord, the God of Israel himself, is their inheritance. Instead, the sons of Levi conducted religious duties for the Israelites and were supported by the ties of the rest of the nation. Concerning Joseph, when we studied the tribes of Reuben in the month of Tammuz, we learned that because of Reuben's rebellion and moral failure, his double portion as the firstborn son of Jacob was taken from him and went instead to Joseph, according to Genesis 48.5. Whereas Reuben was the firstborn son of Jacob by his first wife Leah, Joseph was the first son born to him by his favored wife Rachel. You will recall that Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob, the one to whom their father gave the multicolored coat. In jealousy, his brothers conspired to sell him into slavery and conceal the crime by reporting to Jacob that he was dead. He was carried off to Egypt. Through much affliction and adverse circumstances, he was miraculously promoted to the second highest office in the land and was used of God to save his whole family, which later grew into the nation and all the tribes of Israel. Joseph does not himself have a tribe. His progeny is referred to as the house of Joseph. So around the Mishkan or tabernacle, and when it came to apportioning the land of Canaan, we see the allotments of Ephraim and Manasseh in the place of Joseph and Levi. Let's go back now to where we were. Ephraim was the second son after Manasseh, born to Joseph in the land of Egypt toward the end of the seven years of plenty, just before the seven-year period of famine. Genesis 41.52 records of Joseph, in the name of the second son, he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Literally, the Hebrew name Ephraim means double fruitfulness. He was born to Joseph during the fruitful seven years in Egypt. Also, it is a masculine form of the word Ephrath, which in the Bible is another name for the town or region of Bethlehem. As we just saw, Joseph was the son of Rachel, and we are told in Genesis 35:19 and 48:7 that she was buried along the way to Bethlehem and Ephrath, which could be part of the reason Joseph chose this name in memory of his beloved mom. Of course, Bethlehem in Ephrath is significant in the Bible and Messianic prophecy. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. That's found in Micah 5.2. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, we see Micah's prophecy quoted by the Magi in answering King Herod when he questioned them about the whereabouts of the king of the Jews that they had come to worship. Moses blessed Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh together, which reads in part in Deuteronomy 33.17. His glory is like a firstborn bull, and his horns like the horns of the wild ox. Together with them he shall push, or gore, the peoples to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. The rabbis teach that this first statement, his glory is like the firstborn bull, or it could also read, his firstborn is his ox, is a reference to Joshua, who was from the tribe of Ephraim and was the man God used to drive out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan before the Israelites. 
This may seem confusing, associating Ephraim with the firstborn when he was the second son, but let's look at another passage. With each tribe so far, we've been reviewing Jacob's blessings on his 12 sons just before his death, as recounted in Genesis 49. In Genesis 48, we see that Joseph learns that Jacob's health is failing, so he pays him a visit along with his sons Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob asked that they be brought close to receive a blessing, and Joseph positioned the sons Manasseh, the firstborn, at the right hand of Jacob to get the firstborn blessing, and Ephraim, the second son, at Jacob's left hand. Now, the scripture says that Jacob knowingly crossed his arms so that his right hand, imparting the firstborn double portion blessing, came upon Ephraim. The scripture continues in verse 17 through 20 to say, Now, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, so he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father. Father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you, Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Even to this day, the Jewish people commonly bless their sons on special events like the evening of Shabbat and at bar mitzvahs with that very phrase, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Jacob concludes in verse 22, Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers. Ephraim's portion in the Promised Land after the conquest is fairly central. You can see them right here in the middle. But it is considered one of the northern tribes. When King David's grandson Rehoboam ascended the throne in 930 BCE, the northern tribes split from the house of David to form the northern kingdom of Israel, whose first king, as we see recorded in 1 Kings 11.26, was Jeroboam, who was of the tribe of Ephraim. The royal house resided in Ephraim's territory, and the name Ephraim is often used in the Bible as synonymous with the entire northern kingdom. In 723 BCE, the northern kingdom was conquered and deported from Assyria. Since then, the tribe of Ephraim has been considered one of the ten lost tribes of Israel, but we know that God no never lost anyone. He knows exactly where they are and is regathering them to the land of Israel even this very day in fulfillment of prophecy. Some notable personalities from the tribe of Ephraim include Deborah and Samuel, both judges, as well as Joshua, as previously mentioned. At least two of kings coming from Ephraim were particularly wicked. The first king, Jeroboam, and also King Ahab, who you will recall was married to Jezebel. And the land of Ephraim was buried in Shechem, the bones of Joseph, which were carried out of Egypt. Joshua and Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the first high priest, were also buried in this region. As I studied this month, I pondered the significance of the tribe of Ephraim being associated with Tishri, and this is what I have gleaned. Tishri is the month emphasizing and pointing to the return of Yeshua Messiah and to the Messianic Kingdom age to come, especially as the month focuses on the three fall feasts yet to be fulfilled. Ephraim is the son who inherited the double portion of Joseph, and Joseph is a type of the suffering Messiah, fulfilled in Yeshua's first appearance. Joseph was rejected by his own brethren, the sons of Israel, who sought to block his right to his inheritance by selling him into the hands of the enemy, as good as dead, they thought. 
But what Satan meant for evil, God turned to good, and ultimately Joseph's inheritance was restored. In fact, he received a double portion, which was fully realized, and passed on to his sons Ephraim and Manasseh. These sons increased their tribes to build the kingdom of Israel in the promised land. In the same way, Yeshua was rejected by his own brethren, the Jews, the sons of Israel. He died on the cross, but God resurrected him. Through trust in his redemption and resurrection, we can all enter into eternal life. You can say that we are his progeny, and his double portion inheritance from Father God passes to his tribes, firstly the Jews, and then to all the nations of the earth, at least whoever believes and receives in faith. Through us, he will set up and fill his messianic kingdom at the end of this age. So, summarizing our study of Tishri, we see that in this month everything is judged and the Torah is the standard by which we are weighed in the balance. But there is a period of grace, the days of awe, allowing us to repent and get right with God. Then we who are the redeemed of the Lord inherit the kingdom, culminating in the messianic kingdom age to come. Each year, as we cycle through the months of the biblical calendar, we rehearse these truths in the study and observance of the Feast of the Lord. And each year, we should, at least we have the opportunity, to cycle higher in the realm of the Spirit. To understand Tishri, we need to understand the Fall Feasts. Don't forget to look at the next video to be posted in a few days. Now. The Shabbat before Rosh Kodesh is known as the Shabbat Mevarakim, which means the Sabbath of Blessing. Rosh Kodesh for the month of Tishri this year, 2016, begins the evening of October 2. So let us enjoy the Berkhat HaKodesh, the Blessing of the New Moon. First, we'll listen to the Blessing in Hebrew. Yehi ratzon milfenecha Adonai Eloheinu velohe avoteinu shetechadesh aleinu et hachodesh haze letova belivracha vetiten lanu chaim aruchim chaim shel shalom chaim shel tova chaim shel bracha chaim shel parnasa chaim shel chilutz atzmaot chaim sheyesh bahem yurat shamaim beyurat chet Chaim she'ein bahem busha uchlima. Chaim shel osa vechavod. Chaim she'tahe vanu ahavat Torah veyurat shamayim. Chaim she'yemale Adonai mishalot debeinu letava. Amen. Sela. Now I'll read the blessing in English. May it be thy will, Lord our God and God of our fathers, that you begin for us this month for good and for blessing. May you give to us long life, a life of peace, a life of blessing, a life of sustenance, a life of physical health, a life in which there is fear of heaven and fear of sin, a life in which there is no shame or humiliation, a life of wealth and honor, a life in which we love Torah and fear God a life in which the Lord fulfills the requests of our hearts for good. Amen. Sila. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. Drop by for the next Biblical Feasts and Seasons video on the Fall Feast Tabernacles. And Shalom for now.